All right, so this um, series, this is the first class in a series entitled The Kingdom Parables, The Kingdom Parables, and this will be the introductory lesson. First lesson in a series of lessons uh, which will review a particular type of parable called the Kingdom Parable. Now, if you were to take all of Jesus' sermons and all of His teachings together and study them for a particular style or a particular uh, central theme, you would learn that the central theme of His preaching, especially as recorded by Matthew and Mark and Luke, was the idea of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he talked about the idea of the kingdom more than any other topic that he discussed. Uh, he spent a lot of time talking about the coming of the kingdom, uh, preparation for the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom, the, the, the makeup of the kingdom, all aspects of this thing called the kingdom of God. Now it seems that um, in Matthew's gospel, uh, Matthew used the term kingdom of heaven because he was writing for Jews. His audience were Jews and uh, the Jews had been trained to think in terms of heaven as a spiritual dimension. But if you go into the book of Mark, Mark uses the term kingdom of God because his Gentile audience could more easily identify with this. The Gentiles, they had no concept of quote heaven. All right. They had a concept of God or a supreme being of, of sorts, but not heaven. That was a Jewish idea. Um, the Jews used the word kingdom throughout, or Jesus rather, used the word kingdom throughout His ministry. And 13 of His 43 parables begin with the word, the kingdom of heaven is like. So when you, you know, if you've got only 43 parables and 13 of them begin in the same way, uh, you must be trying to get you know, some information across. You, you can tell that that is an important theme. So obviously if Jesus gave so much importance to the subject of the kingdom and our involvement in the kingdom, I think we should be familiar with His teaching on the kingdom. I mean, we should know about that and be familiar with it. So this is the basic reason for the series, to become more familiar with the kingdom by understanding some of Jesus' major teachings on this subject. But first, before we actually go into the parables themselves, I want us to do a kind of a, a bit of a history uh, lesson here. The history or the etymology, the history of the word, how the word kingdom came about, a little bit of historical theology, and also the history of ideas, how the idea of the kingdom evolved over time throughout the Old Testament and all the way into the New Testament when Jesus began using the term. So let's talk about um, theocratic rulership. Theocratic rulership. In the beginning, when I say in the beginning, in the beginning, in Genesis, right? In the beginning, society was designed by God to coexist in peace with extended families sharing limitless resources of a perfectly balanced creation, all under the loving care and the presence of God. So if you ever wondered, what did God, you know, what was His intention when He created man? What did He want the world to be? Well, He wanted the world to be extended families, right, in a perfect situation with all the resources that they needed, with no imperfections, all lovingly watched over by Him, by Himself. Well, we know that that, you know, that didn't last very long, right? So at the beginning, there were no human rulers of any kind. The only present authority was God and His word. That was the only authority. With the advent of sin, of course, we now have a new level of authority that was instituted within the family structure. In other words, once Adam and Eve sinned, there began to be chaos and stress. The balance was uh, you know, uh, knocked over, if you wish, and so God instituted a certain authority structure, but only within the family. And that was that the husband was to have authority over his wife, but there was not any authority structure within general society at that time. The only authority structure was within 
uh, the marriage uh, relationship. After the flood, we you know, kind of fast forward to Genesis 9, after the flood, God gave to society the authority to police itself and to execute justice for crimes. You know, a life for life, right? Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. And He did this in order to provide some sort of mitigating authority to uh, mitigate uh, the sinfulness that had come into the world. So you see the way that this evolves. At first, you know, after sin, He puts authority structure within the family. And then after the flood, He puts in an authority structure within society in general. Now, the first human ruler was actually self-appointed. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, we read about Nimrod. Nimrod forms and reigns over his own kingdom and was probably the main instigator in building the Tower of Babel. This is the first instance recorded in the Bible of a human king and kingdom. We see Nimrod trying to establish himself as a ruler of sorts. Now the word king is translated from a root word in the Greek which means ruler. And the word kingdom comes from a variation of that word which refers to the geographical area that the ruler rules over. So the sinful world after the flood had gotten to the point that it had thrown off God's rule and God's presence and it began to appoint for themselves kings and rulers. God never said to man, you, you have to start appointing kings and rulers. He never said that. It was men, you know, it was mankind who decided to you know, create and appoint themselves as kings and rulers. Now with the selection of Abraham uh, to begin uh, forming a new people who would belong to God exclusively, there was uh, historically a return to family rule with God as guide and protection. And with Abraham, with the appearance of Abraham in Genesis, we begin to see the beginning of the thread, if you wish, that, uh, that God will, you know, will, will stretch out throughout history and we begin to see the formation of the Jewish people and so on and so forth. Up until that time we get information about what is going on, uh, rulers appointing themselves, the world falling into sin, but now with the appearance of Abraham, God will now focus, or the Bible actually will now focus on the story of Abraham and the history of, that, of his generations. And what I'm saying is that beginning with Abraham, God goes back to the rule of the family. Okay? Um, as the nation of Israel um, formed from the 12 tribes descended from Jacob, we still see that contrary to the pagan nations who had kings, all right, the Jews still maintained the tribal leaders as the highest form of authority among themselves and the tribal leaders under the direction of God's influence and presence in their lives. So while the rest of the world uh, you know, is establishing kingdoms and territories and rulers and princes and so on and so forth, you see that the Jewish nation that has none of that. They're not at all like their pagan neighbors. They continue with simply the family rulership and the tribal rulership under uh, God's uh, direction. Although they came into contact with pagan kings, the Jews remained without a king for over two centuries. Up until this time, they lived under what we call the theocratic rulership, meaning God was their king, and He ruled through His word and through His prophets and through the patriarchs, if you wish. And so God ruled them directly through the prophets, through the judges, and then later on after Moses through the law of Moses. Then we hit a period of human kings. Human kings are now introduced into Jewish life, Jewish history. Once they settled in the promised land and while still carrying on military campaigns against border enemies, a movement began to have one person serve as king over the people of Israel. Again, not God's idea, Man's idea. Up until this time, they had no king. Everybody else had a king except them. All right. So as we know, this was against God's will, but He nevertheless permitted the people a change in system, but He warned them that they would, sure, you're going to get what you want, but you're going to regret it. 
And of course, the Bible records the sad experience that the Jews had with earthly kings, beginning with their very first king. And I'm not going to read all these passages. I'm pretty sure uh, in this class anyways, uh, everyone is pretty familiar with the, the various kings, uh, beginning with Saul. What happened to Saul? Well, Saul went mad and he died in disgrace, right? And then of course David was a great king, but he disobeyed God and committed terrible sins. And Solomon, yes, he built the temple, but because he was unfaithful, he led the nation into idolatry. And then after Solomon, the kingdom was divided into north and south after his death. The northern kingdom and its king was totally destroyed because of idolatry and because of the evil actions of their kings. And then the southern kingdom was also destroyed and carried off into exile for the same reason. But the southern kingdom was allowed to return. A small portion of it was allowed to return to Jerusalem uh, in order to rebuild the city and the temple and to populate a small area um, after 70 years of captivity. Um, then we go to um, God's relationship with human kings. The idea that God is a king or has a kingdom is not apparent in the early portions of the Bible. If you read the Bible in Genesis, you don't see that very much in the prophets, so on and so forth. The image of God's relationship and position with earthly kings and his own stature as a king, as well as the entire idea of a spiritual kingdom is developed very slowly by different writers throughout the Old Testament. You know, God cannot reveal a concept that people have no way of relating to or understanding you know, in, one, in one shot. He uses a thing called progressive revelation. He reveals the truth of a matter or he reveals an idea slowly throughout you know, the centuries using more than one prophet to add information to an idea in order for it to take shape throughout, uh, throughout history. And so here we see God slowly revealing a concept one piece at a time over many years through different writers. His kingship and his kingdom is one of these ideas that was revealed progressively throughout the Old Testament. Now we know that human kings were subject to God and feared Him. For example, in Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 to 7, Abimelech, right? Abimelech, king of Shur, feared God's wrath when he unknowingly took Abraham's wife into his, into his harem. And we also see Pharaoh, right, resist God's judgment and finally give in when God destroys the firstborn of Egypt prior to the Jews being released from captivity. So we, we see human kings kind of dealing, human pagan kings dealing with God in one way or another. However, the direct relationship between God and a king actually begins with Saul, the first king of Israel we see that God actually chooses and establishes kings. And so it's significant when we read about that because that's the first time in the Bible and in Jewish history that God actually gets involved or the writers describe Him being involved in choosing a king okay, according, to his, according to His will. So in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 5 to 7, Samuel says that although God permits it, he recognizes that the people have chosen a human king instead of remaining with him as their king. Now what's significant about that passage and that idea is that there in 1 Samuel, this is the first hint of God as king and later on there will be a mention that he also has a kingdom as well. What I'm saying is that before that time the idea that God was a king himself and that he had his own kingdom, that was not an idea that the people uh, were familiar uh, with, that the Jews were familiar with. It was an idea that was introduced and then slowly developed by several prophets throughout the Old Testament. So as I said, it's taken a long period before the ideas that God is a king with a kingdom, these ideas are introduced into the Jewish mindset. All right, another you know, development of the idea of king and kingdom is uh, man as divine king. There's another idea that came out. Um, another parallel that existed 
where the idea was that a, a human being could be a divine ruler of sorts. Now the Egyptians may have been the very first to combine the idea that the king was a descendant or a product of the gods and therefore divine. You know, they had the sun kings, the sun kings. Uh, this may have been one of the reasons why Pharaoh was so stubborn seeing Moses as an equal descendant of the gods and simply a rival that he had to defeat. You ever wonder why he was so adamant in refusing? I mean, he, he, all kinds of things was happening to him and he kept refusing. Remember, that Pharaoh, that king, considered himself a descendant of the gods. And so he sees Moses saying, well, he, Moses saying, I'm, I speak for God. And so for Pharaoh, it's like, well, wait a minute. I, <laughs> I'm a descendant of the God, not you. And Moses said, no, no, I'm the descendant of the God. And so it was a kind of a, you know, a tug of war here as to see who was the real descendant of God. Had the Pharaoh not considered himself a divine king or a d divinely appointed by his gods, he may not have been as stubborn as he was in the story here to refuse to allow the people to leave as his country was being destroyed before his very eyes. So anyway, a little speculation there. The Greeks, they revived the idea for Western civilization, this idea that a human could be a divine king. Uh, uh, this began with Alexander the Great, and then the Romans took it over uh, Augustus Caesar, who lived 63 BC to 14 AD, he saw his role and person as an incarnation of the gods and thus began emperor worship throughout the empire. And so when Christians confessed Jesus as Lord, as the divine king, this caused the wrath of Rome and their subsequent persecution because they said, no, no, Jesus, he can't be a descendant of the gods. Uh, Caesar is the descendant of the God. He's the, he is the human being that represents God, not this Jesus, not this carpenter that we executed, this criminal. And so you know, the persecution began. Now the idea of the divine human king did not survive after the fall of Rome. So it didn't continue in the West, in Western you know, civilization in Western ideology, but it did continue in the East. Uh, in Japan, for example, the Shinto religion uh, believed that not only the, the emperor, but the whole island came from God, you know, that the whole island was divine and the emperor was divine and they had you know, divine rights uh, even before World War II. Uh, if you remember, their, their flag was a, a sun with with rays that went you know, all around like this. And, the, and the, 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 uh, the significance of that was that they were at the center. They were a divine island ruled by a divine emperor and their, um, uh, their authority, their destiny was to rule over all of the world. That's what all the rays kind of stood for. And when the war was over and they signed the surrender declaration, there were many conditions. And one of the conditions was that they had to change their flag. They had to remove the rays. They could keep the sun, but they had to remove the rays, thus taking away the concept that they had a divine right to rule over, uh, over the world. Anyways, just a little historical data there. In the Jewish world, we see the idea of God ruling as a divine king in heavenly places um, through David. David describes God in this role, Psalm 47, two and three, Psalm 101. So we, you know, this idea that I said evolved over time, developed over time, we see it really coming to fore in David's writing in the Psalms, you know, that God is the king and he has a kingdom. Now the earliest direct reference to the title king being used for God is in the eighth century before Christ and it was used by Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah chapter six, verse five. So by this time in the Jewish mind, the idea that God is the king who rules over all the kings is firmly fixed. So I've given you about 1,200 years here of history in 10 minutes, all right? I mean, we've just kind of zoomed over it. But it's, uh, it's about 1,200 years from Abraham 
to uh, Isaiah. And during those 1200 years, this concept that God is the king and rules over all the kings and he has his kingdom, this idea was slowly developed until it began to be fully expressed in the writings of Isaiah. By this time, excuse me, from this point to the idea of the divine king taking on a human form and dwelling among men and inviting all men into his divine kingdom will be processed by several other prophets over another eight centuries. So it took 12 centuries to get the idea of God as the divine king of kings and having a kingdom. It's going to take another eight centuries to develop the idea that this divine king, God, now comes in human form and invites people to come in to God's, God's kingdom. All right, so let's talk now about the king and the kingdom in the Old Testament, shall we? After Isaiah, the prophet Zechariah and Obadiah began to describe the Messiah as a charismatic ruler or king who would appear and renew the golden period of Jewish history and that would be the period of Solomon. This leader, they said, would rule from Jerusalem. This was the, you know, the content of their prophecies about the Messiah. They wrote that he would purify the nation, that he would save the nation from its enemies, that he would have sovereignty over all of the nations. So it was this kind of prophecy that stirred the hopes of the nation for a redeemer and a savior to come in the future. These prophets filled out the description of the quote, one to come spoken of before, but not well pictured. So before these prophets, Isaiah and Zechariah, Obadiah, the idea of the Messiah to come was nebulous. He was coming in the future and there was a promise in the future, but these prophets really began to kind of sketch in and, and give shape and form to who this Messiah was going to be and what he was going to do and what kind of person he was going to be and how he would relate to the uh, nation. Uh, Daniel, the prophet Daniel, he picks up and he develops this image even further in Daniel chapter seven by giving an exact historical time when this person would come. Up until this time, it was just, yeah, he's coming in the future. And it's going to be great when he comes. And it's going to be wonderful. And he's going to rule over the nations. But when is that going to be? Well, sometime in the future. But Daniel comes along and he pinpoints exactly when in the future this is going to happen. In Daniel chapter seven, he describes the rise and fall of four world kingdoms and then the establishment of a fifth kingdom, that fifth kingdom which would be eventually the kingdom of God. Okay? So Daniel, however, adds two important ideas to the ones that were already mentioned by Isaiah and Obadiah, Zechariah. He adds some more information. Number one, that the Messiah is a divine king, not just a human ruler. That was new. You know, before then, a ruler will come, a king will come, someone who will restore Israel, yeah, but now uh, uh, Daniel is saying, yeah, this ruler, this king is going to be a divine king. That's a new idea. And secondly, he will uh, rule not only by himself, but he will rule with his people who will constitute a divine kingdom. Now, today, that, that idea doesn't throw us for a loop, right? Because we've got the New Testament. We, we get what he's saying about the divine king and the divine kingdom. You know, we, we're in, we enter into God's kingdom. We, we become part of that divine kingdom. But if you're living in Daniel's day, if you're living at that time, you're having trouble wrapping your mind around the idea that the Messiah will be a what? A human ruler, but he'll be divine? And, and we will enter into a divine kingdom? How does that work? Not quite understanding. So the concept of the Messiah as a divine king ushering in a special kingdom to rule over all of the kingdoms was finally expressed in its fullness by Daniel. 
This set the stage for the last two prophets to speak about the kingdom of God and they would speak about the kingdom of God in the New Testament. So the first of these, as you will guess, is John the Baptist. So John the Baptist comes along, the people are anticipating a king who will purify and save and exalt the Jewish nation over its enemies. John's initial preaching falls in line with these expectations, right? What's he saying? Repent and be baptized to purify yourself and to be ready for what? The kingdom is coming, oh! So it's not just the kingdom's out there in the future sometime. John the Baptist said, no, 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 no. The kingdom, it's now, it's coming, it's imminent. And then secondly, the people responded to him with this recognizable message. Even if they didn't quite grasp the divine king idea and the divine kingdom, this thing that the prophets had said would one day come was near. And so what do we do? They say, how do we get ready for this? Do we build a temple? Do we, you know, what do we do? And what did he say? Well, repent and be baptized for your sins so that you are now ready for the kingdom. They didn't quite understand what all was going to happen. They just wanted to be ready for it. John also announced the divine aspect of the kingdom by speaking of the Holy Spirit and how the one to come would baptize the people with him, with the Holy Spirit. And I make a little parenthetical statement here. In the New Testament, there is no such term as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That term does not appear at all anywhere in the New Testament, okay? The term is, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You see the difference? A baptism with the Holy Spirit means with. He gives you, 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 you receive it. It's with the Holy Spirit, right? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism that belongs to whom? Well, to the Spirit. You know, it's, it's, it's the Michael's baseball bat. Well, who does the bat belong to? It belongs to Michael. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Whose baptism, you know, who does it belong to? Well, it belongs to the Holy Spirit. And the question is, well, what baptism belongs to the Holy Spirit? Well, the one that Peter preached on, <laughs> on Pentecost Sunday, you know, repent and be baptized. What will happen? You know, be baptized, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one that's giving that baptism. How? Through the word, through Peter. And then what will happen? And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is that? I will baptize you with the Spirit. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the water baptism. The baptism with the Spirit is the receiving of the Spirit. All right. Some people say that's splitting hairs, but trust me, that's not splitting hairs. It's important to understand the difference between these two things. But I digress, I digress. So John announces the divine aspect of the kingdom by speaking of the Holy Spirit and how the one to come, Jesus, would baptize the people with him. Now one idea that had not yet been developed and caused some confusion for John and the people concerning the kingdom was that they thought that the king and the kingdom were two different things. And they believed that these would be a great political change when he came. They thought that, well, the king would come and then he'd establish this kingdom over there, this physical thing. Because in their mind, they thought, well, ruling over all the kingdoms meant that you know, they would rule over everybody else uh, like they did back in the day with David and with Solomon. So there was confusion. All right, so let's talk about Jesus now as the king, as this Messiah. When Jesus finally arrives, he follows John's preaching about the kingdom, but he tells them that the kingdom has now arrived. So someone said, what's the difference between John's preaching and Jesus' preaching? Well, it was essentially the same. You know, repent, be baptized, get ready for the kingdom, except John was saying, the kingdom is at hand, and Jesus was saying, the kingdom 
has arrived. It's here, it's among you. The deduction is that if the kingdom has arrived, then what else has arrived? Well, the king has arrived as well. At first, with his miracles and teachings, the people wanted to see Jesus as the king that they imagined. But when the political changes did not happen, they began to reject him and were confused. Even John was confused, right? He sends his, uh, his, some of his disciples to Jesus and to ask him, are you, are you the one that's supposed to come? You know, he said, wait a minute, if, if, the king, if the king has come and the kingdom is here, why am I in jail? <laughs> you know, and why is Herod still on the throne? And why are the Romans still in charge? And why are you being chased from place to place and hiding out and preaching out in the desert? I don't, I don't understand. And what John didn't understand was you know, the way prophecy works. In prophecy, the prophets tell you they tell you the things that are going to happen. You know, a, B, C, and D, and E. These are the five things that are going to happen. But what the prophets don't tell us is how much time in between each of these things. And so Daniel talked about four kingdoms, right? Four kingdoms. Well, five kingdoms with you know, the arrival of Jesus, right? But he didn't, he didn't say how many years between the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire. And the, you know, uh, he didn't, he didn't give a difference. He didn't tell how many years would, would, would elapse between, excuse me, the Babylonian Empire and then the Medo-Persian Empire, and then how many years would go by before the Greeks took over, and then how many years would go by before the Romans took over, and then how many years would happen, would go by before you know, the kingdom was established. And so John, in his mind, is thinking, wow, the, king, the kingdom is here, the, the king has come, let's go, it's done. You know, it's the end of the world, we're going to take over. He didn't realize that the, <laughs> the coming of the king and then the establishment of his kingdom, uh, there were many, many years that would take place. A few years between the coming of the king and the establishment of his kingdom, and then many, many years before that kingdom grew to cover the, to cover the entire, entire world. Again, progressive revelation and progressive development of the kingdom. Easy to see you know, when we're looking back, easy for us to see, not so easy when you're in the middle of this thing uh, trying, to, uh, trying, to figure, trying to figure it out. So Jesus is the one who develops fully the concept of the kingdom only partially described throughout history by uh, different prophets and he clarifies things. First of all he explains that the divine king is at the center of the kingdom not like human kings that are above. Human kings, it's always top-down management. In the divine kingdom, the king's at the center and the kingdom is around him. He also explains that the kingdom is not earthly, it's not political, it's not military, but it is spiritual in nature. He also tells them that the kingdom is made up of the king and those who are united to him by faith and not by culture. That was the big problem with the Jews. They believed, well, we belong to this culture and that automatically, you know, that automatically gets us in, that makes us the people, that, that, that automatically uh, uh, puts us into the kingdom because we, we're sons of Abraham. But Jesus says, no, your membership in the kingdom is by faith. The hardest thing for the Jews to accept was not only was their membership in the kingdom based on faith, but the Gentiles could also be in the kingdom by faith, even though they were not related to Abraham by culture. Jesus also explains that the kingdom has a past, and the past of the kingdom is the prophets who spoke of it and those who hoped for it. The kingdom has a present. Jesus himself manifests its king and provides an earthly dimension for the kingdom. And what is the earthly dimension for the kingdom? The church. That's why we say the kingdom and the church is, the, is one and the same. One little difference, however. The kingdom exists in heaven, in that spiritual dimension, but it also exists here on earth. And the form that it takes here on earth, we call it the church. Those who are, the, the word ecclesia, church, means 
those who are called out. Originally, the term referred to the, um, the elders of a city. In other words, the city elders, they were called out to become and serve as the city elders. Jesus appropriated that term, ecclesia, and made it as a reference to His people and the kingdom. And from that time on till today, when we use the word church or ecclesia, no longer refers simply to a, you know, like a political thing, it really makes reference to those who are called out of what? Well, called out of the world to do what? To come into the kingdom, to be separated from the world. Uh, and th then the kingdom also has a future. At the end of the world, all aspects of the kingdom, both earthly and heavenly, will merge into one unit. So the kingdom on earth, which is the church, and the kingdom in heaven, which is the church, those who are in heaven, will come together and make one single uh, unit. And so that brings us to the parables. Jesus' parables on the kingdom, which, we'll, you know, which we are going to study, will describe the nature and the tension between the present condition of the kingdom and its future consummation when He returns. The kingdom looks like and feels like and is like a certain way now, but Jesus explains that one day it will be in another way. It'll have another <laughs> look, if you wish. And the study of the kingdom parables helps us to understand the difference between how the kingdom is now and how it will be when Jesus returns and we're fully uh, consummated, we're fully glorified uh, and fully um, um, integrated with the heavenly kingdom. All right, a couple of last things here. A lot of what we think about the kingdom of God today is based on various theological ideas that were developed after the New Testament was written. And I want to mention several of these because sometimes we have, a, you know, we have an idea about the church or we have an idea about the kingdom that isn't biblical and we wonder, well, where does this idea come from? So I, I want to just mention a few of these. So we begin with Augustine, Roman Catholic uh, monk, theologian. And uh, he um, uh, wrote and taught and much of Catholic thinking based on what he wrote. Uh, he, he lived in the fourth century, by the way. So Catholic thought formed by Augustine was that the kingdom and the church were exactly the same thing. They saw the kingdom as a spiritual monarchy where the Pope was ordained as head of the church and the church ruled as a kingdom with lesser officials ruling different parts. This is why popes and cardinals, for example, are dressed like royalty. You ever wonder, well, what are they wearing those robes for? A lot of poor people in the world, why is he wearing that funny hat? And he's got the silk robe. I mean, he, you know, well, because. Catholic theology sees the church, the kingdom, as a monarchy. You know, God is the king. And so his representative on earth is the pope. Well, he's a king too. See what I'm saying? And if you're second in command to the king, if you're a cardinal, for example, well, you're, you're royal as well. You don't have the same opulence as the, as the pope does, but nevertheless, you know, just like the dukes and the duchesses, and you know, just like in British royalty. Same, same idea. For Roman Catholics, the hierarchy of the kingdom, this is what is stressed. When they teach about the kingdom of God, they teach about the, the, the monarchy, they teach about the structure of the church. All right? Now, along come the Protestant reformers, they emphasize the spiritual aspects of the kingdom of God. For example, in Luke chapter 17, verse 20, uh, Jesus says, the kingdom is coming with signs not to be observed. And so the kingdom uh, is not manifested in strict hierarchy like the Catholics, but the kingdom is uh, evident through the work of the Holy Spirit among the believers. And so from, for Protestant uh, theology, the transformation of lives 
This is the sign of believers. All right? um, charismatics, uh, when I say charismatics in the Catholic Church, uh, uh, charismatics are those who claim that they can do miracles or speak in tongues. Uh, if they're not in the Catholic Church, they're called Pentecostals. Okay, if you ever wonder, what, how do you use that term? Well, somebody who thinks they can speak in tongues, if they're Catholic, you call them Charismatics. If someone who speaks in tongues is in a Protestant or Evangelical church, you call them Pentecostals. All right? So that's, that's, that's the division of those, uh, of, those, uh, of those ideas. And so in Protestantism, they developed the idea that the transformation of lives, you know, this was the sign of the work of the Spirit, this was the sign of the kingdom, you know, transformed lives. And the Charismatics, they carried this idea one step further, making the possession of miraculous gifts proof of kingdom citizenship. Some people say to me, it's so difficult to talk somebody who's in a Pentecostal church or something, to, to kind of teach them out of the idea that they can do miracles. And you know, even when I show them the, the passages and I explain to them in Acts chapter two, you know, the Greek word means an actual language and not just some mysterious gibberish like that. Oh, they won't let it go. And why, why is that? Well, the reason for that is <laughs> the fact that they can do these things is the sign that they're actually part of the kingdom. And so for, for someone who's in a Pentecostal church to say, you know what, that speaking in tongue thing, you know, that, that's not really legitimate. That's just, you know, yeah, that doesn't match scripture and so on and so forth. That's almost like saying, I'm lost because I've lost the thing that identifies that I'm part of the kingdom. Now the answer to that, the thing that defines that you're part of the kingdom is the word of God. In Acts chapter two, the word of God says, if you repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus, you know, you'll be saved, you'll be forgiven, and you'll receive the gift of the Spirit. There is no sign that tells you that you've received all of that. The thing that confirms that you're part of the kingdom, that you've been forgiven, that you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, what is the thing that confirms that? Well, the word of God, it's the confirmation. Mark 16, 16, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. How do I know I'm saved if I can't speak in tongues? Well, you know you're saved because did you do that? Did you obey Mark 16, 16? Well, yes. Were you immersed in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness? Yes. Well then, by faith, <laughs> by faith you accept that God has forgiven you. By faith you accept that you are now part of the kingdom. You don't need an additional sign to do that. God's word should be enough for you. If God says you're saved, I, I don't need to do a miracle to prove that I'm saved. All I need is for God's word to tell me that. Again, I digress slightly. All right, reformers and Protestants, modern theologians, modern theology, one of the more uh, popular uh, products, if you wish, of modern theology is what's called the social gospel. The social gospel sees the kingdom displayed as the presence of God making the world a better place to live. Let, let me show you the difference. In the Church of Christ, how do we see God's kingdom being established? Well, I see his word being preached from the pulpit, in books, on TV, through the internet. I see God's word, you know, the seed of the kingdom being, okay. And then I see people responding to that. They're, they're confessing Christ. They're being baptized. They're, 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 they're beginning to live productive, fruitful Christian lives. They're confessing Christ themselves. They themselves are bringing others to Christ. The church is growing. Those are all the signs that manifest that the kingdom of God is growing, is present. The social gospel says you can tell that the kingdom of God is growing stronger because earth's troubles are being resolved. The poor are being fed. Social justice, democracies are being established in, in, in countries that were tyrannized by dictators. You see what I'm saying? The social gospel says, we're going to save the world politically, economically, 
environmentally. That's the social gospel. One of the reasons why the Pope, the present Pope that we have, is so interested in ideas of poverty and feeding the poor and politics and so on and so forth? Well, he, he comes from South America. Well, South America is the cradle of, of the social gospel movement. So he's a product of that in the 70s. I, you know, I recognize what he's doing. So our task, therefore, in the next couple of classes, will be to examine the parables of Jesus about the kingdom and try to see it as he explained it. Not how some theological, uh, some theolog not how Calvin explained it, or Luther explained it, or Augustine explained it, or some Catholic theologian in South America explained the kingdom. We're going to try to unravel the meaning of the kingdom in the way that God, uh, in the way that Jesus explained it. So we're going to begin with Jesus at the center add the church in his image, and then complete the picture with the end of the world where the kingdom, only described in parables by, by the way, and on the Sermon of the Mount, will manifest itself in complete fullness. So complete fullness of the kingdom will be God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the church, the angels, and all the spiritual world completely integrated forever. That is the end game, that's the final end of the kingdom of God when it is fully realized. So, our study of the parables of the kingdom is to help us understand the difference between where we are now, the present state of the kingdom, and our presence in it, and where we will be in the future, the final consummated state of the kingdom of God. So whenever Jesus spoke of the kingdom, there was always a, you know, a, dis, a, a, a distinction made. Whenever he talked about the kingdom, at the end it was always, you're in or you're out, always. There was always the idea, you're either in the kingdom or you're out of the kingdom. So you're in if you have obeyed the gospel in repentance and baptism, and you are faithfully following Jesus, and you're out if you haven't done that. This is always stated or implied this is always the conclusion of the kingdom parable. Some people think, well, they're just stories, but no, they're not. They're powerful preaching tools. Uh, they're tremendous challenges to the individuals who hear them, because Jesus himself is saying to the believers, you're in or you're out. Because remember, the parables, they weren't for the unbelievers. They didn't understand the parables. The parables are for believers, okay? So Jesus is, speaking to us directly when he's talking about the kingdom parables. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much.